Do I need that? I am so glad to see all of you who braved the cold to get here to today. I was talking to my brother yesterday in Chicago about how cold it is in Lake of Florida. Let's see, it's, uh, oh, it's, it's 14 degrees in Arlington Heights right now. Oh, come on. It was warmer here last night. It was 36 when we got up this morning than it is right now in Chicago. And I'm complaining. <laughs> oh, what a delight. He's got a good sense of humor, though. He put up with me through all of that. And he kind of chuckles. He said some people's blood's a little thicker than others. Right. He wouldn't think of leaving Chicago. He loves it up there. Four seasons. And he gets his snowblower out uh, when there's a good snow on the ground and, and goes hunting for his newspaper. <laughs> then he digs it out of the snowblower and sees how much of it's still readable. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you this morning. It's never too late for a new beginning. Richard shared the 10 top New Year's resolutions last week, and I ran across this one. I said, you know, this is a good, good topic. I want to, and, and let's just kind of get started here, kind of lay the foundation. You got your Bible, get it over to James chapter 5, and I'm going to be kind of flowing off of these two verses. James chapter 5. Verses 19 and 20. Now James writes, and he closes out his letter with this. My brothers and sisters, if any one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now, has there come an age when a person is too old to turn from their sins? I'll say no. But there's even a little broader perspective on this. That antique table caught his eye, one of those farmhouse auctions, for many years, probably decades. It had just sat out in the barn. Chickens had roosted on it. Old greasy tools had sat on it. In fact, through the years, all sorts of trash had been thrown on it. It was filthy and flimsy. When the auctioneer called out its number, no one even bid on it. So he bought that old table for just a couple of dollars and next week took it to a man who loved to restore old furniture items in, in a furniture items in a shed behind his house and he stripped it down and to its bare wood and over the course of several days restored it to a thing of beauty it once was. That table is now one of his most cherished possessions and conversation pieces. Isn't that beautiful? A nice communion table, man. Yeah, that'd make a nice communion table. Have a nice one. But we'll settle for the one we've got. It works too. God Himself is in the restoration business. You've got handout notes there in your bulletin, so you can fill in the blanks here as we go go there along. But coming from there, God is in the restoration business. It's never too late for a new beginning for anyone. Every once in a while you'll hear the news, somebody way past their 21, 22 years decides to go back to college. <clears throat> and we get a tickle out of it when they're getting their graduation, their college degree at 70, 80, sometimes even 90 years old. I forget how old the oldest graduate, I think there's one over 100 that graduated from college. So all of you that always wanted to go to college never yet got it done, it's still not too late. You may not finish in time to graduate, but at least you'll get to say I went. There are people all around us who have been relegated to an old barn somewhere, beaten up and broken up by life circumstances, and finally put off the side where they began to lose their beauty. Maybe a sin in your past. Maybe discouragement. Maybe... Just a turn of bad luck. There are some people homeless, not because they really wanted to be, but because they lost their income and couldn't afford to pay rent anymore, and they were living out on the street. So they hadn't found a way to solve that problem. But there is a land of beginning again for any and all of us. 
to whatever you are, wherever you are, why you are, where you are, there is still, it's not too late for a new beginning. Let me give you an illustration. How about Peter? If someone ever needed restoration and a new beginning, it was Simon Peter. Peter had no had been so self-confident, boastful in his commitment to the Lord Jesus, asserting that even if all the others turn back, I will not turn away from following you, even to the point of death. He was true to his word until he was accused of being a follower. Yeah. Remember that story? Jesus had been arrested in, in Luke chapter 22. Let's get over there, Luke. We'll look this up together. Chapter 22. Talking about verse 54. Nice long <laughs> chapter. Then seizing Jesus, they led him away. Luke chapter 22, verse 54. They took him into the house of the high priest, and Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. And a servant girl saw him and seated there in the firelight, and she looked closely at him and said to this man was with him. But he denied it. A woman, I do not know the man. A little bit later, someone else saw him. You're also one of them, sir. Uh, one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. An hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow is with him, for he's a Galilean. Peter replied, uh, uh, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned around. Amen. Looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows three today, you will disown me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. I can only try to imagine Peter's pain. When he was recognized, the rooster crowed, uh, the crowd signaled, the uh, rooster crowed signaling the coming dawn. And he cried, oh, what have I done? What have I done? What in your past would you cry in the corner of your room, in your little secret place, and cry, oh, God, what have I done? What have I done? After the resurrection... Jesus provided Peter with three opportunities to reaffirm his love for him on the North Sea of the Galilee. Peter's second chance was not only possible, but it was also profitable. You see, Simon Peter never turned back. Restored, he led the church into its greatest days of growth. In Matthew chapter 16, remember when Jesus was transfigured, he made this comment, and it wasn't just about Peter. When Peter said in verse 16 that you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Of course, this was long before Jesus went to the cross, at least several months. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this is not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on the rock, which I believe is of the confession that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, I will build my church and the gates of hell or the, any government of the world, by the way, Glenn's paraphrase there, will not overcome it. Amen. And I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so Peter became a changed man. The Bible contains many accounts of people who got a second chance, uh, uh, men and women who got a second try. try. Uh, who would have picked a murderer to deliver a nation from slavery and lead them to freedom? God did. Moses killed an Egyptian in Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. Let's go look it up. Best to go right to the source and see what the Bible says about it. Exodus chapter 2. Verse 11, on the day after Moses had grown up, one day after Moses had grown up, he went down to where his own people were, and he watched them at their hard labor. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. 
And the next day when he saw two Hebrews fighting, he asked them, in the, one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? He said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing to me uh, as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, uh-oh, what I've done must have been made known. And decided to leave town. But 40 years in the desert enabled him to take advantage of a second chance. God had a plan for Moses. And it was to give him a second chance. And he became a great emancipator of his people. Moses told Pharaoh, let my people go. And when Pharaoh wouldn't pay attention to him, I'm bigger than your God. I'm bigger than, than you are. I don't have to do what uh, you want me to do. Moses, through God through Moses, taught Pharaoh a lesson about who is actually bigger. Just a little side note to our government. Praise God for a president who realizes that God is bigger. Amen. And praise God for those legislators and judges who realize that God is bigger. But there's a few that have a lesson to learn yet. Pray for them that they will soon realize that God is bigger. Oh, how about David? David is described in 2 Samuel chapter 11 as a man of God's own heart. Let's see, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but what happened after this man of God's own heart? And, uh, 1 to 27, David sent Joab out with the king's, whole arm, uh, king's men and the whole army to destroy the Ammon Ammonites and besiege Rabbah, and David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked out around on the roof of his palace, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And uh, the man, he inquired about her. He said, that's Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And David sent messengers to get her. She came to him. He slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. And the woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Now just to cut down to chapter 13, verse 1. Nathan rebukes David. And in chapter 13, he kind of uh, reminds him of what you think you've done, uh, what you think nobody knows, God knows. In verse 14, because, but because of doing this, you have shown contempt for the Lord. The son born to you will die. David committed adultery and murder. And we read David's prayer of repentance in Psalm 51, and we see what qualifies people for a second chance. When we say, oh God, I have sinned. Oh, how can I even lift my head in your presence? Please <coughs> cleanse me. Please be merciful. Please forgive me. We all want forgiveness for those things we do. How about Jonah? Ooh. Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. He uh, tried a different kind of fishing. <laughs> He was the bait. He disobeyed God. And, and, and God said, Jonah, I want you to go talk to these people about their sin. And Jonah said, I don't want to do that. So he went this way, west to the Mediterranean Sea, got on a ship trying to sail far away from there because he didn't want to do what God told him to do. But you know what? If God's called you to do something, you better obey him because otherwise you might pay quite a consequence. The seas got rough. The ship's are floundering there. What's going to happen? Jonah realized that he was the reason the ship was floundering. He said, well, guys, I don't like this, but I disobeyed God. You're going to have to throw me into the sea if you want to save your lives. So Jonah literally walked the plank and became fish bait. We don't know whether the fish had teeth like that or whether it was a fish or a whale. Or we, we always think of a whale because we don't know of any fish that big. But God is capable of doing things. But see, Jonah got a second chance. He punished him. But that whale had a little bit of regurgitation, indigestion or something like that. And he uh, was close to shore when he did that and spit Jonah up. Can you imagine? It's totally dark down there. Stomach juices all around you, eating up on you. Am I getting a little too graphic? 
and he sat there for three whole days. Mm, yuck. I'm sure he would hope that that whale spit him up with water so he could at least wash off before he got to land, but God gave him a second chance, and he was obedient this time. How about Saul? Saul, who we also call Paul, was a persecutor of Christians until Jesus got a hold of him. And when Paul saw the light, he repented and was baptized into Jesus Christ and became the most outspoken and prolific writer of the early church. And so we realize that God is a God of second chances. And we don't know how old any of these guys were when these... Well, we know Moses was 80 years old when he got his second chance. We don't know how old the rest of them were. But by our years, they were old enough. The second chance is possible. But here's something very important to remember. The second chance is automa not automatic. Just because you sin once doesn't mean God's going to give you a second time. See, Judas did not get a second chance when he turned Jesus in to the Pharisees and the priestly leaders because Judas did not repent. So he did not receive the opportunity to be restored. If we don't repent of that sin that we've done, we cannot be restored. The rich young ruler did not get a second chance. Oh, he was remorseful uh, upon hearing the demands of silence, uh, of uh, obedience, of discipleship. The Bible says he went away sorrowful. There's nothing in there that says that he did what Jesus told him to do. So far as we know, that rich young ruler did not get a second chance. Sorrow is not the same as repentance. Now I know that you've got things in your life that you feel sorrowful about. But if you don't feel sorrowful enough to say, I need to stop doing that and do what's right before God, there's no repentance. If there's no repentance, there's no second chance. God can't work with us when we're so oddy and arrogant and, and demanding that I did not do anything wrong, I did not lie, I did not do what you're trying to say I did even though you caught me with the weapon in my hand or the body right there and, and even though there's video showing me doing it. If you don't repent, there's no second chance. How about Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor who condemned Jesus to death? He tried to wash his hands. And, and say, <laughs> this is not my fault. This is all on you. You want it? Okay, but I, 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 he's regretting that he did what the crowd wanted. But he didn't repent. No second chance. Now let's go to the other side of the coin. See, second chance is possible, but it's not automatic. It's reserved for Peter, people like Peter who don't merely remorse feel remorse, but they try to reform and who truly repent. See, Peter definitely took advantage of his second chance. They change their mind, which results in a change of action, and as they do so, they find a new beginning. Every one of you, when you came to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you said, I've sinned. You had a change of mind. I don't want to do that bad behavior anymore. I want a second chance. And so, you turned your heart over to follow God's will for your life. Peter went from his seaside meeting with Christ to a powerful preacher on Pentecost, and his message brought the, about the birth of the church. In fact, in Acts chapter 4, verse 20, a little further. Acts. There we go. Four. Verse 20. When Peter and the other apostles are called before the Sanhedrin, before the local government, you can't speak to anybody in Jesus' name. You stop this prayer before city council in Jesus' name. You stop passing, stop passing out Bibles in school because that's a violation of what we interpret as a church, separation of church and state and all this sort of stuff. Peter said, huh, we cannot but speak of the things of which we have seen and heard. You go ahead and try to stop me. But I got a second chance. I got a chance to be restored by Jesus himself. And he said, feed my sheep. And I'm not going to quit. In fact, 
Peter died being crucified upside down from the best we understand of history because he did not consider himself worthy to be crucified like Jesus was crucified. And to maybe be more graphic than I need to, but to humiliate the person being crucified more than they ever show us in any of the pictures. They did not have any undergarments on when they were crucified. They were crucified completely naked. Shame in front of the world, exposed in front of the world. How cruel can you be? And yet Peter did not recant this time. He stuck to it even to the point of death. James closed his letter with those important reminders that sin can wreck homes, hearts, plans, and people. But your sin can never keep God from loving you. Oh, I want to spend some time on that. There is nothing, absolutely nothing you can do, including blaspheming the Holy Spirit, that will keep God from loving you. Now, that doesn't mean he won't punish you if you don't obey what he says. And he says the only way to eternal life is through Jesus Christ our Lord. James was shouting in verses 19 and 20. He who turns a sinner back from the ways of sin has saved his soul from death. Can you hear him? He's talking to you. It's never too late for a new beginning. Every time I see a restored antique, I'm reminded that God specializes in the restoration business. All of us know people who are like that old table used to be, who are battered, who are bruised, who have been struck back by the corners of life, having lost their beauty, and are not being used for any real purpose. Maybe at one time you have felt that way yourself. James concluded his letter with that challenge to us. Take the sinners and the broken people you we know by the hand and bring them to the one who can make them old things pass away and make all things become new. God can use you. I know most of you are older than I am and I'm old. <laughs> I decided when I got past 65 I'm no longer middle age I'm now old I plan on being old for at least as long as some of you are maybe longer I will see how that works out with what Richard said about medical technology that, that, that what I said uh, 45 years ago would well, live to be 100 and preach the day I die might well happen <laughs> we're keeping ourselves healthy for a lot longer Morty you may just have to stick around a little longer than you thought you were going to stick around I hope not and you get to sing all the way through it, too. You're going to be singing all the way till God says, Okay, Morty, I've had enough of you. Actually, he's not going to say, I've had enough of you. He's going to say, Come up here. I want it up here now. But anyhow, don't rush. I like having you around. God desires that all of us get into the restoration business. You see, the Greek word restore, let's go over to Galatians chapter 6. I've got to get, read that so we get it in the best context. Galatians chapter 6. Verses 1 and 2. My brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you too may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way fulfill the law of Christ. Now, Paul framed it like that in Galatians chapter 6. That was his way of saying it. The Greek word restore is a medical term that means to set a broken bone. That's why I stuck that picture up there. Uh, now, maybe all of you have broken a bone at one time or another. Broke a collarbone, broke a finger bone. Uh, and, and it hurts. But I went to the doctor and they set it back in place. They restored that broken bone. You see, when someone breaks a bone in his or her arm, a doctor sets it, realigning it, and putting a cast on it to keep it in place until it heals. And then during a period of about six weeks... God does the actual healing. Bone, you were attached here. You need to build a little bridge across there and reattach again. That's what bones do. Isn't it amazing how God makes our bodies? We can break a bone, they can put it back together, and God can cause those bones to hey, you're bone of my bone and bone of my bone. Let's bond together and be bone again. And He can heal that bone. 
amazing what well, God can heal. Is there something in your life that you need to have reset? And healed? Our job is to find those people, broken people who need a second chance. Like this house. Probably damaged in a hurricane. It looks like they wrote the address on it. And you can see they are in the process of restoring it to its former beauty and usefulness. We are able to, rest we are to restore those who are broken. We are to help get their lives and priorities lined up with God, with Scripture. And once the realignment is done, God can then do the healing. Richard Gerenswald felt led to start a new church. He wanted some help. So he found a few battered and bruised antiques laying out in the barn. He brought them in. Dusted them off, polished them up a little bit. Marvin Johnson, Morty Thompson, Dan Parker, and me. And he put him back to usefulness. It's never too late for a new beginning. And I want to call you right now. Look at your life. Look at what God is doing in your life. It's never too late for a new beginning. Today is the first day of the best of your life. God, how can you use me today to reach out and encourage and touch somebody and lift them up and maybe draw them closer to Jesus and help them find a church home? We're going to have a, an end, uh, decision song right now.